one of the greatest pleasures of being the Dean of the School of Public Policy is being able to be involved in events like this. And I'm looking around, I see a number of familiar faces and others that I, I hope I will become familiar with. But to be able to, to host an event like this that brings together individuals who have been researching issues that we're going to be discussing today and also practitioners who are actually working on these issues. This is what a school of public policy is all about, to take critical issues and look for the real solutions that can actually move us forward. It's also, I think, uh, exciting to the school of public policy because we're able here to do a second thing that is happening today, which is to pull together related issues, issues that cannot be solved if we still fight them. And to bring together the issues that are on the table today is really the only way to move forward. And so to have a discussion that brings together all of the, <coughs> all of the communities that need to address it, from practitioners through scholars, and to bring together the, the breadth of issues, I think, is, is critically important. The third thing, before my voice goes entirely, um, <clears throat> that I think makes it so appropriate to be able to have this conversation here today is, is that this conversation is not going to resolve all of these issues. This conversation will take us forward, but in order to actually make the progress that as a society we're going to need to make on this complex of issues, we're going to have to continue to engage in a dialogue. We're going to have to continue to challenge each other with new ideas and testing the ideas that are out there. Testing the theories in practice, testing the theories against data, seeing what the data tells us against practice and against about theory. That has to be an ongoing discussion. And so what I want to encourage is that this be an ongoing discussion, that this not be a one time when we get together here, but that we get together here whenever we can move this discussion further forward. And also <clears throat> to recognize the role that journals like Bonnie's journal play in moving that discussion forward, getting the critical ideas that come out of a conversation like this, getting that out to a wider audience of people like our friends in British Columbia who can't be here today, getting those ideas out to them and being able to bring them into that conversation. So let me also encourage you to get the ideas down on paper in ways that can be shared through journal publication and on my age, down on paper, down on electrons, um, so they can be shared through journal publication. Um, <clears throat> again, forgive my voice. Um, I'm not nearly as contagious as I sound. Um, too much time in faculty meetings. Um, it is a real pleasure uh, to welcome you all here to the School of Public Policy uh, today. And I truly hope that I see all of you regularly back here as we wrestle with these issues. Bonnie, thank you so much for the opportunity to, to welcome people here. Well, thank you so much for coming and again. getting us started. <laughs> so thank you all for being here today. I'm so pleased to have uh, all of you here. Um, it's been sort of exciting getting all the abstracts together and uh, participation from people who are actual practitioners and, you know, as one of our presenters said, oh, people who are actually helping people and not just talking about it. Um, Anyway, I, well, there's so many people to thank. Um, this will be a, hopefully a continuing dialogue. This is our first um, annual forum on uh, health, homelessness, and poverty. And I've gotten so much interest in the event after we already closed the abstract and closed this uh, event that I really anticipate we will be having ongoing dialogues about this going forward. Um, so I want to thank very much Dean Rhodes and everyone at the School of Public Policy who's been a tremendous support for getting this day ready. It's been uh, wonderful the amount of support they've provided for us. Um, other sponsors of the event are the Center for um, Nonprofit Management, um, Philanthropy and Policy, which is part of the public, uh, Department of Public and International Affairs um, at George Mason. Um, also, ASPAN is another group that has sponsored the event. And I guess I should say, um, also, oh, before I move on, I just wanted to say also uh, the Policy Studies Organization, which is run by uh, Paul Rich, uh, Paul is over here with Dan Gutierrez Sandoval, and um, we're here today because of their generosity they've, um, and their encouragement. They really are um, tremendous at um, supporting events like this and dialogues like this. Um, the inspiration for this event uh, first uh, came from 
uh, like so many other things that come to me from a, a former student of mine. So I want to acknowledge Jan Michael Somerco way or something, stand. <laughs> um, because the idea for the event, he, he generously comes back and speaks um, to my class almost every semester. Um, and part of what he does is he gets to talk about uh, why is program evaluation important? Uh, why do we have to let our, uh, whoever's funding our endeavors, uh, whether they be uh, taxpayers or philanthropists, we have to demonstrate effectiveness for them. We have to let them know that what they're uh, supporting us in our endeavors, that we're actually accomplishing something. So um, that suits my purposes very nicely because I can tell people that there's a practical import to what we're learning here. But also, he gets to sort of um, spread the word about a cause that he's really passionate about, and he's a very effective and inspiring spokesperson. Um, so he provided the impetus for the event, as have others of my former students. Uh, uh, Nicole Truy, who I don't think she's here yet, but she's going to be speaking on the last panel. Um, she works at Village Voices, and Shannon Steen, who is also in the program evaluation class of mine, um, he's in the back and he's going to be chairing a panel. So no one ever escapes my clutches once, <laughs> once they're in class with me. Um, so anyway, that's our, um, the inspiration for the event. And like I said, when I heard Jan talking, I started thinking, of all the connected, interconnectedness between all the policy issues that spin around the problems, the problems of health, homelessness, and poverty, and how we can, in, with our interdisciplinary um, faculty and other resources, that maybe we can really bring some, some help to bear on these really difficult and transient problems that we have. Um, I'd also like to thank um, Arnold Roy. <laughs> oh, okay. Our senior editor, Arno Nikogosia, um, is here as well. He's the senior and founding editor of the World Mental and Health Policy Journal. Um, and the journal wouldn't be here if it wasn't for him as well. So um, we also have a lot of um, supportive um, board members on, that help uh, the journal to thrive. And um, they're supportive in our endeavors. And I just want to acknowledge um, we have two university professors, Gary Kreps. Um, and Susan Tolchin um, are both uh, board members, and Barry Clendenin is also um, a World Medical and Health Policy uh, board member. So I'm happy to have their support as well. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to get um, us started off. Our first and uh, speaker in our keynote address will be given by John Lozier, and he's the executive director of the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council. Well, thank you. Uh, it, it's really good to be with you all today. I'm, I'm so happy that, that you are taking the broad interdisciplinary approach that Dean Rhodes talked about because that's really what homelessness ends up being about. Uh, as, you, as you may have seen there, I'm a southerner. I'm sort of branched in history. I come from the deep south. So I've lost some of that. Uh, and I, I will talk a little bit today about history because I think that the work that we're engaged in is really work um, that belongs in a, in a broad historical context. I did develop some quick learning objectives here for this, uh, for this presentation um, and uh, you see them there. I, I'll start with a brief history of where we are uh, of, of where our human rights perspective has come from. It goes back a good ways in time to the Enlightenment. Uh, the number 1776 means something to everybody in this room. Uh, that was really one of the first uh, very clear declarations um, of human rights as a, as a broad concept. Previously, rights had been established in the Magna Carta and elsewhere, but they were privileges, they were private laws. And in the Enlightenment, as we moved away from the brutality of the, of the Middle Ages, uh, we moved from the concept of privileges to the concepts of rights that are more encompassing. And our um, founders expressed those in, uh, in ways that we all remember. I've highlighted this, this second clause here. To secure these rights, governments are instituted among men because, because we are in an election season. Uh, and it's important to remember that from our very beginning, we have been about government being responsible for making sure our rights are protected. So this was 1776. 
1791 was our Bill of Rights, but it was also the, the Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen in France, a, a document that was as influential as anything that, that we wrote uh, on, the, on the world stage. And then in 1793, something you've probably not heard of, the Declaration of the Rights of the Woman and the Citizen. Uh, those of you who read French can do better than this, better with, uh, with this than I can, but the mothers, the daughters, the sisters representing the nation demand to be uh, included in the National Assembly, and it, and it goes on from there. From the very beginning of human rights thought, we have understood human rights to be an evolving notion. Uh, we started with men uh, and, and white men, and have, have grown from there. It took us a while uh, to get around to the sorts of things that uh, Ms. Degouge was, was describing. Let's jump forward to the last century, just ended. It started off pretty well in terms of our understanding of human rights. The suffrage movement in particular uh, was important. Teddy Roosevelt was sort of the face of the progressive area era, uh, but it was really women who were who were driving the changes that occurred early in this in that century. Uh, but things really began to deteriorate worldwide very very quickly. World War One, um, with all the horrors that, that that some of you know about, all of you know about. I hope maybe the one good thing that came out of World War One was a recognition that the use of chemical weapons was an assault against all humankind, was a, was a crime against humanity, was a violation of human rights. Um, but World War I took us off on a different course and we only went downhill from there as humankind. This is the rape of Nanking in 1938. This is representative of the industrialization of genocide by the Nazis. This too. This is after the firebombing of Dresden, Germany. This is a new horror that our people introduced onto the world scene. This is this is from a later test, I think, but the culmination of the madness into which the world had descended was our introduction of atomic weaponry. In Hiroshima, 166,000 people died, most of them in an agonizing period of about two months of radiation burns. It's something, I grew up under that shadow. I was born in 1952, no, this was 1945. I grew up um, in the south, in the range of the missiles in Cuba, and thinking every time I heard a plane fly over that that was the missiles coming to do this to us. Uh, it's not distant past. It's not old history. It's something we've continued to live under the shadow of. The world was horrified by what we had become and what we had done. And uh, with leadership from Gail Hall, from my state as Secretary of State, I live in Tennessee, as Secretary of State, and, um, and other people of goodwill from around the world, the United Nations was formed, and one of the first things that was done by the General Assembly of the United Nations was the adoption of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which I have provided to you uh, for this session. This is from the time when that happened. Can you hear it? Okay. Universal Declaration of Human Rights may well become the international magna carta of all men everywhere. We hope this proclamation by the General Assembly will be an event comparable to the proclamation of the Declaration of the Rights of Man by the French people in 1789, the adoption of the Bill of Rights by the United States in 1789, 
by the people of the United States and the adoption of cultural declarations at different times in other countries. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights has become what Eleanor Roosevelt hoped that it would. This is a really iconic, famous photograph of her uh, that, that gives her the credit that she deserves uh, for, uh, for this, this movement in human history. Uh, she probably wouldn't like it because if the picture were to be true, she'd be standing shoulder to shoulder with a lot of other people who worked on it. We're, we're part of that, is, is, is sort of my point in this, in this whole history lesson. We are coming from a, uh, a tradition of people fighting for a set of concepts that were put together in order to keep the sorts of horrors that had happened in World War II and World War I from occurring again. We've not been real successful at that, but you know, all in all, we haven't had another world war. The notion was that those events happened because of a lack of respect for human dignity. And that in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, we could begin to define what human dignity really means. Our work, I direct the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council, we're a membership organization of people who provide primary care to homeless people all around the country. Our work really comes or, or relates to Article 25 in the Universal Declaration, which declares very boldly that everyone has the right to housing and medical care. But we understand, uh, and human rights theory posits, that all these rights that you, there are 30 articles in the Declaration that you have before you, they're, they're all interrelated, they're interdependent, they're indivisible, they're inalienable, and they're universal. They apply not just to individuals, though they do. It's not about human rights are not about entitlements for 47% of the people or 1% of the people or 99% of the people. They only exist when they apply to everyone equally. Uh, and they depend on each other in their application. We've been very fortunate that um, the Universal Declaration and that concept of human rights has motivated people around the world in various struggles that have advanced the cause of humanity. And we're very fortunate to be part of that, um, that chain of events. The Universal Declaration itself does not have any enforcement teeth. But the world community has adopted a number of treaty mechanisms to begin to codify uh, human rights and, and begin to, uh, to enforce them. The two major ones are the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. And I'll note right at the top that that very division violates the spirit of human rights. If they're all interconnected, all indivisible from each other, what happened here in the Cold War uh, violates that from the beginning. The West in the Cold War really focused on the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, rights like I'm exercising right now. The Soviet bloc focused on economic, social, and cultural rights. And there's this big international treaty that defines those and has some enforcement teeth. The United States is one of the few countries in the world that has not ratified it. These are treaties that require Senate confirmation, and our Senate has not ratified that one. Of the other major human rights treaties, the only other one we have not yet ratified is the Convention on the Rights of the Child. We are alone with Somalia, uh, not, rat not ratifying that one. I cannot explain or defend why that is the case. Um, in the Supreme Court case on the Affordable Care Act, the National Health Care for the Homeless Council submitted an amicus brief, a friend of the court brief, uh, supporting the Affordable Care Act. And we based our argument on international law. There were a number of ways we could have argued, but we looked to our country's obligations under the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, no, knowing that that did have force that we don't have 
it's here in the, in the this covenant that uh, the right to housing and the right to health care exists. But understanding that part of what the Affordable Care Act was intended to do was to overcome the, race, the health disparities that are related to race uh, that we know uh, in our system. Those are inevitable in a system that treats health care as a commodity, as a market commodity rather than as a human right. Uh, and, and we argue that in order to overcome them, uh, we, need to, we need to look to that form of international law. Um, though the covenants exist, there's no real threat that the United States can be hauled into court for people not having access to health care or for people being homeless. There are efforts to look at that. There's the United Nations has uh, recently concluded a uh, special rapporteur who uh, examined homelessness in the United States and housing in the United States and found all sorts of violations, made all sorts of recommendations, but nobody's going to force the United States to adopt those. It's really up to us to do that. The obligation of states in this international framework is that we don't actively violate human rights. Uh, that we comply with these with the treaty obligations that were there earlier, and that we advance the realization of human rights. And that's where that's you know that's what our day-to-day -day work needs to be about is moving human rights forward, um, including in the allocation of national resources. So, how are we doing? Um, and and we we see some of that through the lens of homelessness. To jump back to the last century, uh, when you know, the, the dramatic failure of, of uh, unregulated capitalism occurred in the 30s, we had the last episode of mass homelessness in this country. There had been others, particularly related to the aftermath of, of the Civil War. Uh, but this is, this is the, uh, the really memorable episode. We moved beyond that in large part because of World War II uh, and the jobs that that brought and the period of so-called normalcy that that, um, that that introduced after the war. A lot of that had to do with the GI Bill, with the, uh, with the educational support and the housing support that, uh, that the GI Bill provided for our returning veterans. In that period of normalcy, um, it became sort of the uh, the accepted uh, manner of things that un structural unemployment would be five percent in the in the economy. A reserve workforce of five percent of the people unemployed was considered normal and all right. It strikes me as outrageous, but that's how we were going along in normalcy. Then all of a sudden, in the early 1980s, there was mass homelessness again. And it, it came really as a, as a surprise, and it came um, as an expression of a uh, recession, sometimes called the Reagan recession, it, it started earlier. Um, but we had 10% unemployment, double what was normal. 15% poverty rates. The HUD budget, uh, starting under Jimmy Carter and continuing with the vengeance under Ronald Reagan, was cut by 75%. So support for low-income housing was just pulled out from, from under the people. The institutionalization of the, of the mental health uh, hospitals uh, had begun much earlier again, but, but had really sort of reached its climax in the 1980s to the point that there was no real capacity in the institutions for people with, with serious mental illnesses to find care. And the baby boomers, us, were reaching adulthood and the age of God's of schizophrenia. Um, and services were simply lacking. Veterans from Vietnam uh, were appearing on the streets. Uh, they tended to come back and have a longer period of uh, support from their families and friends 
in what we're seeing now, and we'll get to now in a minute. Also, we need to remember in the early 80s, this mysterious, scary new disease was, was appearing. And there was an awful lot of stigma and discrimination. One of the things that happens in, that, that drives homelessness is there is this shortage of housing that's, that's affordable for poor people. And people look to um, other, other resources, friends and family, to put them up, and then eventually lose that. So it's the, and it's the people who have the most severe personal problems who tend to be squeezed out of those natural support systems. People with mental illnesses, people with substance abuse problems are the ones who most quickly lose their support. And health insurance was a problem even then. In their so how do these things look compared to today? Sad to say, but not much different. Really, um, unemployment it seems to be coming down, but but we've been hovering for a long time, well above five percent structural unemployment. Poverty is about where it was. The housing crisis has extended. It's not just a matter of, of financial supports for really poor people anymore. It's reached the middle class, and we're begin we're seeing all sorts of people who are um, who we never would have seen in homeless services before. Uh, we've been squeezed by the housing crisis. Uh, the behavioral health care system still has not been rebuilt. Our children are becoming adults, so there's that, you know, that, that population of young people who need to find a, a place to fit in. I mentioned veterans already. We, uh, we're all keenly aware of that. And we still have 50,000 new cases of AIDS every year and nearly 16% on insurance as of that's a September number. These are the drivers of homelessness. These are the things we need to be addressing. Um, they, it adds up. This is the 2011 point in time count from HUD. Um, 643,000 people experiencing homelessness on one night in January in this country. That's the people they could identify. Everybody knows uh, that that number is, is far too small, but it is the established number. And the, and the breakout is there. As I mentioned, families, um, intact families, so-called intact families, are more and more um, showing up on the streets and in, and in the system. Um, we're making probably better progress on veterans than on any other subpopulation due to an incredible effort by the Veterans Administration to uh, overcome homelessness among veterans, but the numbers are still unacceptably high. These numbers of chronically homeless and severely mentally ill people in the current homeless population are based mostly on guesses of the people who go around counting people in the middle of the night. Um, so that, and they're significantly lower than most estimates of those particular morbidities. Um, I mean, mentally ill people and substance abusers and chronically homeless too is um, is just a guess. That takes us to just a little um, aside, perhaps, on homelessness and health care. I do come from an organization that works in that arena. And as early as 1987, we knew the basics of what was going on. People um, were becoming homeless because of poor health. I mentioned the behavioral health issues that will squeeze people out of a of the housing poor situation, but also very clear economic situations. More than, well more than half of the personal bankruptcies in this country are caused by health care problems. And bankruptcy leads to foreclosure and eviction, leads to time with family and friends, leads to the streets. Uh, you intervene where you can, but, but that's a path that we're all so familiar with. Once you're homeless, homelessness itself causes health problems because of all the exposures in the shelter system, exposure to, that, to, to disease and violence uh, on, the, on the streets, exposure to the elements, uh, poor nutrition that you can't control, it all adds up, escalates, um, and, and homeless people end up being very, very sick. And then homelessness creates barriers to healthcare. You don't have any money to pay co-pays, to, to 
by transportation. Um, there's an awful lot of discrimination in the service system so people can get access to care. Um, those, those three things um, paint, a, paint a picture of very clear links between poor health and homelessness. And our job as, as, uh, as advocates and as service providers is to break those links. Um, the bottom line in, in homelessness and health is excess morbidity. Uh, the data shows that homeless people suffer all the same diseases and illnesses that everybody else does, but generally at about three to six times the rates that everybody else does, and that homeless people die early. The average age of death seems to be about 47 years old in a country where the average age of death is about 80. This is a situation worth addressing. There are a number of things being done to address it. Um, to, and y'all are, I, I think, many of you involved in efforts that are described in these ways. They revolve around housing. Homelessness is a housing problem, of course. We have um, learned that putting somebody in housing by itself um, is is an effective intervention for their health care. We've learned that particularly from our friends in the HIV AIDS community who study very closely. Um, we've learned that you can't put people in housing and just leave them there. That permanent supportive housing, the supports need to be there, and by and large, those are health care supports. We've learned uh, that you can't treat the body and the mind separately nothing that's not common sense and that we haven't known for a long time. We've learned it perhaps again in our work on homelessness. We've learned the extent to which trauma affects people who are homeless. Um, our clients tend to be people who have uh, suffered trauma maybe all their lives and the experience of homelessness itself is traumatic. And we've learned to try to shape services so that they are trauma-informed so that we're aware of how what we do may be triggering other experiences for people in particular. And we're looking closely at care transitions. One of the places where people get lost in the system is when they move from one care setting to another or from one provider to another. And we'll hear some from Jean Hockman later this afternoon about um, her work around those care transitions. <coughs> For us, it boils into the three things at the bottom. It always has. We've always understood that the solutions to homelessness have to do with affordable housing, with livable wages, and with universal health care. How does this relate to back to human rights? Well, we insist on dignity and respect. It's the bottom line in the whole evolution of human rights that people have inherent dignity and must be treated with respect. That's something we try to build into everything in healthcare for the homeless uh, and encourage throughout the homeless service system. We focus on access to care uh, in that, uh, that kind of incrementalist approach to implementing human rights. We've been very supportive of the Affordable Care Act. You'll hear from Barbara DiPietro later today about, uh, about the expansion of access to care that the Affordable Care Act brings to almost all homeless people. That's critically important, and we see it as human rights work. At the same time, we try to understand what's going on there with, with health care reform through the lens of universalism the human rights principle that, that uh, the rights apply to everybody and we understand that uh, the Affordable Care Act doesn't reach everybody. It's going to leave something like 20 million people uninsured, including people who are not documented, and including people who are simply too gravely disabled to work the system enough to get enrolled. Um, and, and so we end up being advocates of something more. We've not finished with the Affordable Care Act. We are some payer supporters, uh, but we 
that that's because we see that as an avenue to truly universal coverage that implements people's rights. We understand that the issues are interrelated, just as human rights theory does. You can't treat the body and not the mind. Uh, so we integrate primary and behavioral health care, understand housing as part of health care. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, we're committed to inclusion. Perhaps the most profound expression of human rights is, the, is its insistence that people who are affected by decisions that are made be involved in the making of those decisions. And throughout our work, we try to implement that from the exam room where we focus on uh, patient self-management goal setting, uh, motivational interviewing rather than the wise doctor being the one who tells the patient what they need to do, uh, to our boardrooms where uh, we're very serious about implementing the requirement in the law for uh, governments of community health centers that we're part of that consumers, the language that health centers use, uh, be a majority of the board. Very difficult when working with homeless people. We're working on it. We're taking that very, very seriously. I understand that in the planning of this event, you've worked with homeless people here in Arlington and, home, and homeless service agencies, and I want to applaud you for that. There's, there's no part of our work on homelessness uh, that should go forward without that sort of input. It's the most, the most important thing we can listen to is the voice of the people who are most directly affected by the decisions uh, that, that are being made. This is what I've been saying is so broad, and I know so many of you are drilling down to very practical little bits of knowledge uh, that in turn will be applied through organizations like ours and our friends in the, in the government to how things are actually done in working with people. I, I, I want to thank you for that. And at the same time, I want to encourage you to kind of keep your eyes on the, on the prize, on the, on, the, on the big picture, and to understand that you know, even if you're stuck in the library late at night sometimes, you're working on things that are really important that are about um, the highest aspirations that human beings have for each other that are expressed, I think, in these, in these terms of human rights. So uh, I, I just wanted to tell you I appreciate that. A little bit of recommended reading for you that touch on some of the things that I've touched on here. If you're not attuned to the Holocaust, we'll, we'll put my Elie Wiesel's a great place to start. If you're not attuned to the effect of nuclear weapons, John Hershey's little book on Hiroshima is a great place to start. Doris Kearns, Goodwin, Good, Doris Kearns Goodwin's book, No Ordinary Time, is about Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt. Um, it's not a little book, um, <laughs> but it's a great book. It may be a Pulitzer Prize winner or something, but um, a great place to understand the context of the times in which this body of thought really emerged. In 1987, I, I showed you before, the Institute of Medicine published Homelessness, Health, and Human Needs, still a definitive work for us. And in 2010, and updated annually since then, the U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness published Opening Doors, for the first time a federal strategic plan on approaching homelessness, that, um, on ending and preventing homelessness, that will um, that, that includes all the things that we need to do in a, in a way we had never done before as a nation. So I recommend those things to you. And I also recommend our website. Um, it's in hchc.org. There is a wealth of information about homelessness and health there. Um, everything from adaptive clinical guidelines, how you do things differently, if you're treating a, a homeless person as a, as a clinician to rarefied policy discussions uh, and, and, and everything in between. It's really a, a rich and deep website which we've developed with support from the Health Resources and Services Administration that funds the Healthcare for the Homeless programs. You can also join our organization, donate to it. The website does all the things it ought to. Uh, 
you're doing the things you ought to. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you.